Hey you guys, welcome back to the salon. Two things, obviously I got some new glasses, which I think are kind of cool. And also, uh, sorry this video is going up way later than I would usually put it up, but why did I decide to review five movies like all at once when I really didn't have time to watch all five of them like before this video was supposed to go up? This took way, way, way longer than I was anticipating, but better late than never. So hopefully you guys can uh, give me a little bit of leeway on that because this was uh, a big undertaking. So I'm gonna admit right up front, uh, I'm not usually the world's biggest fan of found footage movies. Um, of course, there are exceptions to that general opinion. Uh, you know, found footage movies that I actually like, like, you know, Cannibal Holocaust, uh, Blair Witch Project, uh, Creep and Creep 2, Wreck, Poughkeepsie Tapes, Troll Hunter, uh, as Above, So Below, One Cut of the Dead, movies like that. Honestly, though, um, if I'm going to really love a found footage movie, it tends to be one that's presented more in like a mockumentary style, like uh, Lake Mungo or The Taking of Deborah Logan or The Bay or Naroy the Curse, stuff like that. So I tend to like that more than I like found footage, but I have seen a lot of found footage, footage movies that I liked, so it's not like I'm just like shitting on the entire subgenre. That said, though, uh, I'm a sucker for a good horror anthology, as my shirt will attest. Uh, and I'm going to say that when, like, the concept for the VHS series of movies actually, like, intrigued me from the outset, although I didn't actually see them until, like, a few years after they, after they started coming out. Um, I mean, having spent my formative years during the era of VHS tapes, because I'm old as shit, uh, I was actually kind of drawn in by the retro aesthetic, which a lot of people weren't doing in found footage at that point, um, and that the idea that the stories would be presented as true found footage, like in other words, as a series of found videotapes that had like whatever horrific shit on them that someone had recorded for some reason at some point in the past. I just really liked that theme, you know? So the first VHS film uh, arrived on the scene in 2012 and had like a pretty decent pedigree behind it. It was actually created, the concept of it was created by um, Brad Miska from the formidable uh, website and uh, horror production company, Bloody Disgusting. And it actually featured segments uh, directed, one of them was directed by Adam Wingard, who had already done the excellent movie like You're Next in 2011 and obviously would go on to a lot, do a lot more. Uh, David Bruckner, who hadn't done that many like films at this point, but he would go on to do The Ritual, which is great, uh, The Night House, which was also great, and The New Hellraiser, which was pretty good. Uh, you got Ty West, who obviously like really a uh, big deal in the horror uh, genre nowadays, but even back in 2012 was like a pretty hot commodity because he'd already done House of the Devil, that came out in 2009, and The Innkeepers in 2011, which are also a great. Uh, you also had Glenn, uh, Glenn McQuaid, who did um, I Sell the Dead. Uh, you had your mumblecore auteur, Joe Swanberg, who I don't know, this might have been like the first horror kind of stuff. He did kind of more like indie drama comedy type things. Um, and you also had the three-person filmmaking collective known as Radio Silence, who would actually go on to do Ready or Not in 2019, which I really dug, and uh, 2022's Scream sequel, which I did not see, so I don't know if it was any good or not. So the original VHS, the one that came out in 2012, apparently began as kind of like an organic project, like Brad Miska called it, a living film. Um, essentially, filmmakers that he knew that already had like a relationship with Bloody Disgusting, like the website and stuff, um, and that liked the concept of the film could participate. And it seemed like they were mostly kind of, like it was collaborative, but I guess they were mostly kind of like left to their own devices. They're like, basically, we just want to do, like the theme being a found VHS tape, like something that would have been recorded on VHS, um, and that's pretty much it, and they kind of gave them whatever leeway, and then they kind of like plugged them all together like later on. So the finished movie, while, you know, obviously it's uneven as most horror anthologies are, whether they're found footage or not, and uh, I will say that it suffers quite a bit from that real shaky, chaotic camera movement that, you know, sometimes makes it pretty difficult to tell what's actually going on. This one was actually like pretty effective. I have to say that I really admired its commitment to its theming and I mean because it remains like pretty consistent throughout so much so that I could actually almost believe that the entire thing was made by a single filmmaker. 
So the wraparound story on this one is called Tape 56, and that was the one done by Adam Wingard. I'm going to say it's the weakest of the tales story-wise, but it is, you know, it's an efficient enough immersive framework in which, you know, the other stories can be presented. Basically, it's like a, there's a bunch of, like, real hateable 20-something shit heels who make money recording themselves, destroying things, sexually assaulting women, doing that kind of stuff, and they end up getting a pretty lucrative assignment from some mysterious benefactor who you never really see to go to this particular house and locate a specific videotape containing some unknown content that they're going to get like paid big money for. So once in the house, uh, they discovered this older, apparently deceased dude sitting in an armchair in front of a bunch of TVs. And then the rest of the stories are kind of like unspooled as this group of chodes go through and watch some of the tapes as they're looking for the right one to bring back and get their payday. You know what I mean? So as I said, this frame story isn't all that compelling. Um, the character are all just like interchangeable dicks. I don't even remember what any of their names were. Uh, and you're just kind of like biding time until you hope that they get killed at the end. But it's still like a believable enough set out set up to kind of like get you into the meat of the movie, I guess. So the first proper segment, David Bruckner's Amateur Night, uh, this one's not bad at all. And actually, I think this was the one that I remembered the most because I had actually seen, I thought that I had seen three of these VHS movies like prior to doing this video, but I'd actually, re-watching them, I'd actually only seen two of them. I'd seen the first one and 94, uh, but I watched all of them like over two or three days, like in a row. But uh, this was pretty much the only one that stayed with me and I don't really know why um, because it's not fantastic, but it was like pretty good. So uh, so this story, uh, Amateur Night, concerns yet another gaggle of unlikable Broheims who are staying in this hotel, like, on vacation somewhere. Maybe it's spring break. I don't know. Uh, and their whole, like, mission is, like, you know, Goo, go, gonna go get laid, brah, woo, you know, that kind of dude. And they're kind of hopeful, hopefully going to film some amateur porn on the QT. Uh, and this is going to be facilitated by the one kind of nerdy and not entirely douchey bro who's wearing a pair of glasses that have, like, a hidden camera, like, in the middle of them. So while they're at a bar that night, they're able to persuade one hot drunk girl and one really weird and awkward but also sort of hot girl to come back to their hotel room with them. So now the hot non-weird girl passes out and shockingly the bros don't have sex with her anyway so they're not quite as douchey as I was expecting uh, but they do decide that they're, now they're going to focus their attentions onto the weird girl who it turns out is way weirder <laughs> than anyone possibly could have imagined. And uh, from there gore, broken wrists, torn off genitalia and uh, bat wings ensue. So the next segment is called Second Honeymoon, and this was directed by Ty West. Uh, this one was also pretty good with a great buildup, although I will say that I think the ending, I guess like strained credulity a bit because it seemed like it came out of left field somewhat, not entirely, like it was foreshadowed a little bit, but not maybe not as much as it should have been. So we're following a couple, Sam and Stephanie, uh, and they're filming themselves doing a road trip through Arizona. So at the beginning, you're getting like the usual things that a couple that's on a vacation or a road trip would record themselves doing. One night when they're in their hotel room, though, like someone knocks at the door, and though we don't see this, like Sam answers it and says it was this creepy young woman who's asking for a ride somewhere like the next day. Incidentally, I actually really liked that this exchange wasn't shown because it made this scenario like more believable to me. Like in real life, you wouldn't necessarily, if you were staying in a hotel room on vacation, you wouldn't necessarily like film somebody going and like answering the hotel room door like that somebody knocked on. Like that'd be a dumb thing to record in real life. So I like that it gave it a little bit of like verisimilitude that it's like that it wasn't recorded. And also I thought that it was like kind of eerier that the incident was actually only described secondhand. Like as Sam is talking into the camera, like telling Stephanie what happened and like, it's, and he's saying stuff like, well, this girl, she was like really small. I didn't think she would like could have hurt me or anything but she was still like really creepy or really unsettling and I thought that that was like really effective that it was just being told to you instead of being shown which isn't usually the way it works but I don't know for some reason it worked on this one 
But the mysterious woman uh, apparently goes away. But then later that night, uh, we see that she has presumably gotten into the room somehow and is and has taken their camera and is recording herself like holding a switchblade to like Stephanie's thigh, stealing money out of Sam's wallet, dunking his toothbrush in the toilet, like that kind of stuff. Uh, this part was also like pretty unsettling because it really played on a common fear that a lot of people have, like of being watched when you're asleep and oblivious. Now, the next day, Sam notices that his money is missing and blames Stephanie, although, of course, she insists she didn't take it because she didn't. Uh, Sam clearly doesn't really believe her, though, and makes a kind of, like, cryptic offhand comment about it, how it wouldn't be the first time, or, like, something along those lines, which, like I said, was a little bit of, like, foreshadowing of, like, what the ending would be, but I didn't know if it was, like, enough of foreshadowing, you know what I mean? If you've seen it, you probably know what I'm talking about. So then, when night comes around uh, once more, it appears that the same woman has broken into the room again, but this time, uh, the outcome is much more severe. Let's call it that. Now, in true Ty West fashion, like many of his movies are like this, the bulk of the story is usually like kind of subtle buildup and character development. I mean, some people, people that don't really like Ty West are just basically like, oh, it's like fucking, uh, you know, 80 minutes of like nothing happening and then bam, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it is a little bit like that, but I don't know. I just, like sometimes that works for me, but yeah, so it's just kind of like a lot of like subtle buildup and character development and then all of a sudden he just like pulls the rug out from underneath you like with a very sudden like shocking event and that's the same thing that happens here um but as i mentioned i'm not really sure that the twist because it is kind of a twist um was really foreshadowed quite enough although i did actually like this story overall now the next story was glenn mcquade's tuesday the 17th uh and this was my least favorite of the segments because it was just a pretty simple like slasher type narrative albeit it did have a somewhat original concept for the killer, I guess. So there's a girl named Wendy, and she invites three of her friends to a lake that she always goes to. And then they kind of proceed to do typical slasher movie fodder things like skinny dipping, smoking weed, yada yada. Um, we know something terrible is afoot because we keep seeing like distorted images of what appear to be murdered bodies, like periodically kind of popping up on the tape, like while they're recording themselves. And Wendy um, occasionally makes allusions to some deaths that happened up on this lake previously, though she sometimes like just kind of like later pretends like laughs it off like she was just joking or like fucking around. But in an unsurprising revelation, she's absolutely not joking. And the friends begin to be kind of quickly picked off by a killer, which is actually named in the credits as The Glitch. And it's apparently like some kind of supernatural being that can't be filmed properly. I mean, it looks like a person, but it's just like when it approaches, it's just like a glitchy, like, like that, you know what I mean? Which I thought was like kind of a cool idea. Um, but I kind of wish like the mythology of the killer would have been fleshed out just a little bit. You know what I mean? Like usually I kind of like when you leave your killer, your monster, like a little bit mysterious. So I didn't want, I wouldn't have wanted it like over explained like, oh, it was this person that, you know what I mean? I don't know. Like I need to come up with some like complicated mythology for it. I don't need that. But I just wish there had been like a little bit more like why why this thing was out in this particular woods, and I don't really think that was in there. Um, other than that, I found the segment just kind of like meh. The acting wasn't really all that great, and the justification for Wendy taking all these people up there as bait and then seemingly not being all that prepared for when the killer attacked, like she set some traps and shit, but not really as prepared as you probably should have been. Um, it, so it didn't really make a lot of sense in that regard. I mean, it was okay, but you know, this was not my favorite. So Joe Swanberg's uh, The Sick Thing That Happened to Emily When She Was Younger was actually my favorite one of the stories, even though I have to say it didn't strictly adhere to the VHS format because it was actually presented as a series of video chats. Um, but it did have like kind of a great spooky buildup and a completely kind of batshit twist that I'm not sure worked entirely, but was so unexpected that, you know, I'll allow it. I, I, I let it slide. I let it slide. Now, the story actually focuses on a young woman named Emily. Uh, she lives alone in her apartment, and she has frequent discussions, like, over video chat with her boyfriend, James, who's in medical school in another state, we presume. Now, Emily has had some problems in the past, such as some undisclosed accident, uh, which she never really elaborates upon. 
and she keeps complaining that she has like this weird lump under the skin of her arm which like she keeps like scratching and poking at it and like james tells her to stop meth messing with it because he's like look i'm gonna come visit you in a week and i'll check it out then because like i said medical school but the worst thing is that emily is actually convinced that her apartment is haunted and there are a bunch of like really great tense sequences where she's attempting to prove this to james by walking around her place while like on a video chat with him and you know, sometimes, like, what looks like a ghost child, like, keeps kind of flitting around, like, through the background or off to the side or something like that, and it's really, really creepy. Um, now, the outcome of this one, which, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm trying not to spoil any of these, but uh, the outcome of this one is uh, pretty out there. It's a little bit out there, but I actually didn't mind that. Like, I thought it worked mostly, uh, and this was, I think this was, like, the most original of all the stories and had kind of, like, the creepiest vibe to it, at least in my opinion. I also quite liked the final segment, which was directed by Radio Silence and was called 1031-98. And uh, it had a gang of considerably less obnoxious bros. They were on their way to a Halloween party and they apparently go to the wrong house. The reason this is recorded because one of the, and this was a little bit clever, I guess, but one of the uh, guy's Halloween costumes was like a teddy bear with like a nanny cam, like in its stomach, you know what I mean? So it filmed the whole thing like automatically. So, uh, so there was that. So they go to the wrong house, apparently. I don't know who told them like about this Halloween party, but it doesn't seem like the wrong house. They So they go there, and even though there's clearly nobody home, at first they kind of play along because there's some sort of minor paranormal activity occurring, and that causes them to think that this is just like some kind of elaborate haunted house attraction, and that maybe like the party is upstairs or something like that, and they're making people go through the gauntlet or whatever. Um, so yeah, so they hear stuff upstairs, like kind of voices and screaming and shit like that so they kind of like you know get led up there now although the ending of this is a little bit predictable i did actually like enjoy the ride quite a bit i mean the idea of walking through a brightly lit empty house i did like that they use like that a lot of it happened like in bright light like instead of darkness which is harder to do um and i don't know i just liked that i thought it was creepier and i thought like uh you know just going through this house and seeing like some kind of subtle ghostly shit like oh that that chair is in a different spot than it was when we looked back uh you know what appears to be like an arm reaching out through the wall or something like that it was like really really spooky and i thought it was like really done with a minimal budget i didn't i didn't love the end because you could kind of see where it was going but that was okay like i thought like everything up to that was like really good so all in all, I mean, the first VHS is a very solid, like, found footage film with some great moments, uh, had a really good, like, coherent feel throughout, and, like I said, had a really admirable commitment to its aesthetic motif, which I really appreciated. So because the first film was obviously successful, uh, a follow-up was, of course, inevitable. And VHS 2 was released only a year later in 2013. Now this one was actually a half hour shorter than the original, uh, which was almost two hours, and featured one fewer story. But I mean, this second installment also had some pretty great moments. In my opinion, though, it was it was kind of both more, like, in terms of ball t balls to the wall, like, mayhem and gore, and less in terms of creepy atmosphere and originality than the first one. So this time out, uh, the frame story, Tape 49, is directed by uh, Adam Wingard's frequent collaborator, his name is Simon Barrett, and at least features two more likable characters <laughs> than the ones from the originals wraparound. It's a guy and a girl, Larry and Aisha, and they're private investigators. And when the movie opens, they're actually like surreptitiously filming a guy at a motel, like cheating on his wife. Now, after they get this uh, evidence that they need, they go on to their next assignment. Uh, so apparently this woman has hired them to look into the possible disappearance of her college-age son, Kyle, who she hasn't been able to get hold of for a while. So the pair go to the kid's house, uh, which appears to be unoccupied, like he doesn't seem to be there, and they find the requisite videotapes, which they then proceed to watch in the hopes of finding out, like, that there'll be some information on there to find out where the missing dude went. So as this wraparound story progresses, like, the vanished dude does kind of, like, come into play and, like, factors into the story, along with a little bit of a paranormal slant having to do with the particular order the videos are watched in or, like, some kind of, like, mind control or something like that, which actually factors into the franchise going forward. So the first segment is by Adam Wingard, and it's called Phase 1 Clinical Trials. Uh, and this one actually somewhat cleverly gets around that frequent found footage bugaboo of why would anyone be filming that by making the protagonist, whose name is Herman, 
on the receiving end of an experimental ocular implant that replaces an eye that you find out later he like presumably lost in a car accident. Now, because the implant is still in the beta testing phase, the doctor explains that the eye is going to record stuff constantly for like a temporary period of time so that the corporation can monitor it for bugs. You know what I mean? So they can figure out, like work out any problems, like so they can like give them to more people. Oh, and by the way, the doctor says the implant may also cause some glitches that should sort themselves out like once the implant has properly synced up with Herman's like cerebral cortex or whatever. Now, on his way out of the clinic, Herman sees uh, this girl who's, like, just staring hard at him, like, and he's not really sure why. And then he goes back to his very nice house. Looks like it's in the Hollywood Hills, actually. And he starts seeing some glitches, all right, uh, including his, like, video game controller being moved and what looks like the shape of a person, like, under the covers of his bed. But then things start to escalate very quickly, and he essentially starts seeing ghosts pretty much around every corner like in his house so the girl from the clinic who has apparently followed him uh shows up and tells him that she was actually born deaf and that she got um an experimental cochlear implant from the same corporation and that it allowed her to hear the ghost she can't see them but she can hear them and so he can see them so that's why so from there uh things go about as you'd expect and it's insinuated i'm not sure if this is i mean i'm pretty sure that this is what they what they were insinuating but it's insinuated that the two ghosts that herman sees are maybe people that he killed in the car crash in which he lost his eye i could be totally out of the field on that but i don't think i am uh this segment was actually pretty decent overall um it wasn't all that imaginative and probably like relied too heavily on jump scares but if i had to rank it i think it would probably be my second favorite like out of the four segments so then there's a ride in the park, and this was directed by Eduardo Sanchez and Greg Hale of the Blair Witch Project fame. Uh, this was actually my least favorite um, because it was like just too, I don't know, just like too simple and straightforward, I guess, for my liking. And it also concerned zombies, which eh, I'm really sick of zombies. So you know what I mean? All that basically happens is that there's a guy named Mike and he's out on a bike ride, like in a state park, wearing a GoPro style camera, like on his helmet. And he eventually gets attacked by zombies like in said state park. Now I did like the fairly original angle of having the story like unfolding from the zombies point of view because like after he gets zombified and obviously the GoPro is still going and the revelation that some of your humanity is maybe retained like after zombification. But other than that, this one was just kind of like middle of the road for me. Like I said, I'm not a huge fan of like zombies either. So the third story, Safe Haven, uh, was pretty clearly the best one and also the most over the top insane. So this was directed by, and I know I'm going to mispronounce this, but uh, Timo Jajanto, Jahanto, I'm not really sure you pronounce that, uh, so I apologize. Uh, he's an Indonesian filmmaker who's known, probably best known for Headshot and May the Devil Take You. I haven't seen Headshot, but I did say May, May the Devil Take You a long time ago. And Gareth Evans, who's a Welsh filmmaker uh, who was responsible for 2011 movie The Raid and the 2014 sequel. Uh, this story actually follows a group of documentarians who are making a movie about a secretive cult called Paradise Gates. Now, the leader of this cult, who's referred to only as father, as usually happens in these situations, uh, is pretty reluctant at first to, like, let these non-believers into this, you know, into their compound, their sanctuary or whatever. But after they tell him that their documentary is going to be, like, unbiased and they're like, well, don't you want you to get your, like, message out, like, to the wider world or whatever? Like, so he finally agrees. Once the crew arrives, though, uh, things go south very, very quickly. Uh, there's kind of a whole Jim Jones type of thing like going on and uh, in particular the female producer whose name is Lena she uh, gets pressed into service for some let's call them unholy reproductive duties <laughs> let's call it that so this installment was an absolute bloodbath it was just kind of like organs close-up head wounds exploding people there was just like gore and blood everywhere uh, this one also had a little bit of a zombie vibe, but I mean, not exactly. I guess they were kind of like zombies, but dead people were getting back up and like walking around. But um, I kind of feel like this was much scarier than the previous segment because anything having to do with like creepy cults like that is like pretty scary. Uh, so yeah, I, I think this one was the best one. I mean, it was actually frightening. It was really fun. And it was also like pretty fucked up. 
So the last story, which uh, has the very on-the-nose title of Slumber Party Alien Abduction, so you pretty much know what's going to happen here, uh, comes to us from Jason Eisener, who is the guy who uh, unleashed Hobo with a shotgun onto the world back in 2011. So this segment it actually kind of comes across as sort of like a raunchy teen comedy meets like a scary Steven Spielberg movie sort of mashup type thing. Um, so we're following like three siblings and they're all their kind of like friends and hangers on. And they're kind of partying, hanging out at their house after their parents leave them alone, like for the weekend or whatever. Like, the, you know, the younger brothers are, like, taping their sister having sex with her boyfriend, and then the sister and the boyfriend retaliate by recording the younger brother masturbating. It's that kind of thing. Like, kind of those kind of shenanigans go on. Through it all, uh, their adorable and long-suffering little dog, Tank, uh, some, sometimes gets uh, shanghaied into the tomfoolery. Uh, they strap a camera onto his head, and, like, he just, like, follows them around or whatever. Uh, spoiler alert, the dog doesn't make it. Uh, so... Yeah, I, I was very, very bummed out by that situation. Uh, so I just thought I would tell you in case you get upset by those kind of things, because I certainly do. So anyway, as the title suggests, at some point, uh, the kids get set upon by your kind of like classic gray style aliens and a terrifying chase ensues. This one was actually pretty good too. Um, it had some really good camera work and some pretty natural acting by its um, you know, largely young cast. But gonna say subtracting points for the fucked up shit that the poor dog went through. I, don't, I did not like that. Not at all. Um, and the fact that I don't usually find aliens all that scary in horror movies, although of course there are uh, exceptions to that. So in 2014, the third installment of the franchise arrived in limited theatrical release and on VOD, but I have to say I found this one a significant drop in quality from the first two films. Now, while I'm not averse to the idea of changing things up some, VHS Viral um, seemed to have largely abandoned the found VHS tape conceit of the previous two movies, and honestly, it just kind of seemed like it was just kind of thrown together, like with little thought or money behind it. I mean, a bunch of the segments, are pretty much all of the segments are like barely found footage and they break the established rules of the prior films by kind of like featuring edits between numerous cameras and even bits of something that seems to be like a slickly produced documentary, like not found footage at all. So like I said, it just seemed like they didn't even like go with the concept on this one. So the frame story here, which I didn't even actually realize was the frame story while I was watching it, like until I got some way into the movie, uh, is actually called Vicious Circles. And it was directed by Marcel Sarmiento, uh, probably best known for directing the 2008 movie Dead Girl. Um, so it has to do with a couple named Kevin and Iris. Now, at first, like, Kevin's just filming his girlfriend and himself doing normal shit like you would do, but he kind of seems obsessed with the idea of capturing a viral video that will essentially make him part of something bigger. So one evening, um, he evidently gets his wish when there's, like, an epic police chase, like, occurring right outside of his house, but he isn't, like, he doesn't get out there fast enough to, like, capture it. And then shortly after that, Iris sort of wanders out of the house, like almost like in a trance or whatever, and she mysteriously like, disappears. So Kevin then gets on his bike and takes off in pursuit after he gets like this weird video call from her in which she implies like she that she needs help or she's been taken by someone or something. So over the course of the movie, we kind of chronicle Kevin's search for Iris between the other segments. And it's hinted that there's like some larger force or power, which like, again, I mentioned was teased in the second movie's wraparound um, in that it's using all these viral videos we're seeing as a method of like mind control or a way of like try, trying to drive everybody insane. So the first proper segment, probably the best one, although again, not really found footage, uh, was directed by Greg Bishop, who's actually known for The Other Side and Dance of the Dead. Oh, and he also made a 2016 movie called Siren that was actually a spinoff of the Amateur Night segment from the first VHS film, which he didn't direct. I think that was David Bruckner, but he made a spinoff film like about, about the, the weird girl character. Um, so this segment is called Dante the Great. Now it's ostensibly presented as a documentary about the title character, but I have to say that this short nonetheless features mostly like a regular movie style narrative that 
if you were coming at it from found footage, like no one in universe would have been there to film the shit that they show. You know what I mean? That's what I mean by it not adhering to the found footage uh, format. So it's basically about this guy named John who lived in a trailer park and he wanted to be a magician, but he wasn't very good at it. But at some point, he somehow comes across a cloak that used to belong to Harry Houdini, which can do literal magic, like including making people disappear and teleporting objects and shit like that. So the magician then obviously uses the cloak to become like hugely, hugely famous, but his friend and assistant, whose name is Scarlet, gets wise to a bunch of murders he committed, like with the help of the cloak, and decides that she's going to turn him into the police. So this story does actually have the police finding a secret stash of videotapes that Dante made of his killings because they're like, oh, he filmed everything. But this event, like them finding the tapes, it doesn't really factor into the plot at all and is never really brought up again. It just seemed like that little thing was just wedged in there to sort of tie the movies in with the previous ones. Um, this was actually like a decent short. I liked the story, but I think it would have played better as a segment in a different anthology film because it doesn't really fit in with the whole VHS theme. And I think that was kind of like the problem that I had with VHS Viral as a whole is that the cool thing about the VHS movies that kind of set them apart from other found footage movies was that they were, again, like supposed to be occurring like on VHS tape. So from like an older era, this one, um, it's, it's set in the time that it came out. So it's set in 2014. So you just have stuff that's like all over the map. You got video chats, you got just regular foot, you know what I mean? So it's just kind of like, you know, I, so I didn't love that it went away from the whole VHS like aesthetic because I kind of th feel like that was kind of the selling point of the whole franchise. And that the fact that this one didn't, didn't do that, I think just made it kind of seem scattershot and like not all that cohesive. So the next short uh, was directed by Nacho Bigalondo, who was the guy responsible for the really fun uh, Kaiju black comedy Colossal, which is actually quite good. If you haven't seen it, I reviewed it a while back on my other channel. So um, this is called Parallel Monsters. And again, this was a very decent story, but was barely what I would consider found footage. I mean, it's just very, it's like you could sort of call it found footage because like the guy's like recording his own like experiments and stuff, but I don't know, it's, it's just, it just didn't come across like that way to me. So the story is following a guy named Alfonso. This is set, this one's set in Spain, actually, and is in Spanish. He's actually invented a portal in his workshop that opens onto like a parallel parallel dimension that looks like it's just like this one, but ends up having some not so subtle differences. Let's call it that. So he's actually like overjoyed that this shit has worked. So he switches places for 15 minutes with the other Alfonso, like in the other dimension. So they can each explore each other's dimensions, like and see what's going on in there. Now, at first, the mirror universe seems similar enough to the one that he's used to. Um, but he slowly begins to realize that uh, the humans on the other side of the dimensional portal have some pretty monstrous uh, sexual attributes. Let's call it that. Uh, this one was pretty entertaining and very creative. Like I liked the idea of it, but again, it didn't really strike me as fitting in with the theme that the first two movies established. Like it didn't really have to be found footage. It could have just been like a regular movie. You know what I mean? So the next segment, Bone Storm, was directed by Justin Benson and Aaron Scott Moorhead, who've actually made several damn good horror movies, uh, including Spring, uh, The Endless, After Midnight, she dies tomorrow. I've actually like reviewed a lot of those. Uh, unfortunately, though, Bone Storm was kind of a chore to sit through. Gonna say, uh, probably mostly because it followed two very annoying teenage skateboarders who hire like a camera guy off Craigslist to film them, kind of like doing their lame ass stunts. Now, somehow, all of them end up in Tijuana, and again, somehow like fall afoul of some type of occult ritual, some Santa Muerte kind of, I don't know, whatever the hell. Um, and this kind of leads to a seemingly eternal sequence of them basically just like shooting and cutting the limbs and heads off of various attacking cultists and reanimated skeletons and stuff like that. I mean, the whole thing is like pretty tedious. It's a lot like watching a really boring video game. Although I have to say that like the demon creature does eat the camera guy at the end. So you get to sort of briefly see the footage as the camera travels down the demon's gullet. So, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. After that, uh, we return to the wraparound and it's kind of baffling conclusion uh, as Kevin, 
hits this janky looking upload button that's located in an ice cream van that the cops were chasing earlier, like during the big police chase that he was trying to capture. And this somehow like causes explosions and like general chaos around LA as all, I guess like all the viral videos like take effect like a across the city or whatever or something. I'm not really entirely sure. By the way, I forgot to mention, there are also a couple of seemingly pointless vignettes like sprinkled throughout the film uh, that I guess were meant to illustrate how the viral videos were affecting other people around LA who weren't involved in the main stories. Like there was one with a very stereotypical gathering of like Hispanic gangbangers or whatever, uh, which actually ended up turning homicidal after somebody stuck a grilling fork through the leader's dog's head. And I was like, Jesus Christ, like, leave the goddamn dogs alone. You know what I mean? Even though like the CGI was really shitty. So it's like, it wasn't that upsetting, but still. Um, and it, there was another one too, like where the tables get turned on this kind of sleazy girls gone wild type porn producer dude. Like, when a woman that he wronged earlier, like, threatens to shoot his dick off. Like, unfortunately, we don't get to see his dick get shot off, though, because I was like, I, I kind of wanted to see that. But, uh, yeah, because, like, the cab they're riding in gets hit by a truck. So, you know what I mean? I was like, man, that was that was a disappointment. <laughs> Now, evidently, there was another segment filmed for this movie called Gorgeous Vortex, and it was directed by Todd Lincoln, but it was cut out because it was determined like not to fit in with the theme of the other stories. Now, apparently, I've heard it's available to watch on the DVD and Blu-ray, um, but I didn't see it because it's not a part of the theatrical release, and really, none of these stories really seem to fit in with the whole VHS theme anyway, so I'm not really sure how much the segment that they excised could have been that different, you know what I mean? In case you couldn't tell, I really did not care for this movie much at all. It did have like a few bright spots in it, but mostly I kind of found it to just be like cheap looking and sloppily put together. Uh, most of the acting was pretty subpar. Um, it had like a real irritating like edge lordy kind of vibe to it, particularly in the bone storm segment and uh, way over reliance on CGI and in particular like CGI blood, which come on, you don't really need to do that. Um, honestly, I wouldn't have even minded if this if the stories like weren't all like exactly found footage if the movie had been good, but it just kind of really wasn't. Uh, ironically, though, this is the only one of the five movies in the franchise that I actually had to pay to rent because the first two were actually streaming free with ads on Plex and I think the Roku channel, and the last two were on Shutter, which obviously I've had a subscription to that for a really long time. So I was kind of like pissed that this is the only one that I had to pay for, and it was like the worst one. So thankfully, 2021 brought kind of like a return to the format. You know, the format that had made the first two movies worth watching, like it's kind of selling point, like I said. So VHS 94 uh, made the very wise decision to go back in time and, you know, get back that old school feel that made the franchise's concept initially stand out from like other found footage films and i have to say too i think this one like struck a good balance between like real fast-paced outrageous gore type stuff and like lower key suspense type of stuff uh matter of fact pretty much every single one of the main segments here is good worth watching um although as usual the wraparound is just kind of like serviceable and not really all that interesting with sort of a dumb ending this frame story is called holy hell and it was directed by uh the artist filmmaker and screenwriter Jennifer Reeder, who also made Knives and Skin. In it, there's like a SWAT team and they're carrying out a raid at this old warehouse that mostly, I think they believe that it's kind of like a drug distribution hub, like they're doing a drug raid. But instead, they discover room upon room of dead people, like who it appears have gouged their own eyes out. And they slowly come to realize that this warehouse is the site of like a mass cult suicide that has to do, I guess, with like the brain melting effects of watching the fucked up videotapes that kind of fill the warehouse. So... The story does actually have some eerie imagery, like as the SWAT team like progresses through the building, like some of like, I think in particular, like the one with all the pews, like with the weird mannequins and stuff, that's like really creepy, but it's otherwise just kind of like a means to an end, like how to get to the actual segments. And the twist ending, I have to say was kind of lame and like a little bit on the nose. So the first short is called Storm Drain and it was directed by Chloe Okuno, who would actually go on to do the very creepy uh, and quite good Hitchcockian thriller, which called 
called Watcher uh, that came out in 2022, which I actually reviewed on my other channel. Uh, and this follows a ambitious, an ambitious newscaster named Holly and her cameraman, Jeff. So they get sent on assignment to this storm drain, obviously, to investigate a local urban legend known as Ratman. But at first, all they find is this seemingly homeless guy who's like living in the drains. So Holly, who didn't really want to do the urban legend story anyway, uh, she's kind of like gunning for a Pulitzer, I guess, and she decides instead that she's going to do a story on the homeless encampments that they subsequently find in the drains, like because she wants to do like more of a socially conscious type of thing. But it turns out that there is uh, a basis for this rat man legend after all. Uh, this segment was actually like pretty entertaining and had like a really bizarre like resolution that I really dug. The creature also looks great, gotta say. Uh, adding to the fun of this one is the little fake infomercial for the Veggie Masher. Uh, that was actually directed by Steve Kostansky uh, that plays during Holly's newscast. Um, I thought it gave it kind of like an air of surreal realism. You know what I mean? Because it, it reminded me of like shit that I had taped like from back in the 90s because I used to tape like Mystery Science Theater and stuff like that like off TV and you'd get like these like, like, it's not like they're not quite as ridiculous as the Veggie Masher, but almost. Uh, so it kind of like reminded me of that. So I was like, you know, points there for verisimilitude. I thought that was pretty cool. So next up was my favorite short of the bunch, which was Simon Barrett's Empty Wake. So it's about this young woman named Haley, and she's kind of like, I guess, like a relatively new employee at this funeral home. And so she's been tasked with staying there overnight to host a wake for the dear departed, uh, whose name is Andrew Edwards. Now, the family requested that the service be recorded, you know, hence the videotape, like she's got all these different angles and stuff. But for a long time, like nobody shows up like to the wake, which makes Haley really, really uneasy. She's like, why did they go to all this trouble if like no one was going to come? Also pretty unsettling is the fact that Haley is pretty sure that she heard noises coming from inside the coffin and also notes that the coffin itself seems to be like shifted or like a little bit crooked on its base, even though the manager like specifically straightened it earlier, like before he left. So she calls like the managers, the employers, um, and they assure us like, look, there's no way that Andrew could still be alive in there because he died. I mean, he committed suicide. He swan dived off a building and his head is like basically nothing but a big ball of mush that they couldn't fix. So finally, much to Haley's relief, one seemingly normal dude like does show up at the wake. There's nothing weird about him at all. Um, he only stays for a few minutes though and like prays in some foreign language. But like I said, other than that, like not creepy, not weird, nothing like that. After this guy leaves, though, it becomes pretty clear that old Andrew might not be quite as dead as everyone assumed. So the suspense in this one was like outstanding. And the first part of it played like a really, really creepy episode of The Twilight Zone. But then it goes like more toward the gore toward the end with some pretty like awesome, like real gross effects of like the dead guy's fucked up head. So yeah, this one was good stuff. So the third segment is called The Subject, and it was directed by, again, the Indonesian filmmaker, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, Timo uh, Tejanto, Tejanto, something like that, sorry. Uh, he, you know, like I said, he co-directed the Goria segment of VHS 2 which was Safe Haven. And this one, just like that one, goes real big, bloody, and pretty batshit, uh, just like the last one did. So this story follows like a mad scientist guy uh, whose name is Dr. James Suhendra. And he abducts people uh, from the streets, presumably, in order to experiment on them. Most of these experiments involve things like fusing a man's head onto a set of mechanical spider legs, as one does, um, and just generally trying to create, I guess, like a perfect hybrid between a human and a machine by, you know, kind of cludging them all together. Now, the main experiment that we see the action through is a woman who's only known as S.A., those are her initials, uh, who was kidnapped at some point before, I believe it was a month prior, and has basically had her head replaced by a camera. And like also her arm has been cut off and like it clicks like it clicks like a weapon on there, like too, like which she finds out later on. Um, so not too long into the story, like the authorities storm the, do the mad doctor's lab and yet another big bloodbath ensues as the police are kind of like disgusted by these experiments, like not really considering them human anymore. So at that point, like a bunch of the experiments get loose and start like battling the cops, like are trying to like save themselves. And 
complete and utter pandemonium ensues. Limbs flying, brains pulled out of heads, lots of other blood-soaked hijinks. Uh, another really, really fun, like, crazy outing uh, from this. In I mean, Indonesian films, if you've seen any Indonesian films, they tend to be, like, real over the top. Like, this, just, like, fucking gore flying everywhere, and this is absolutely no exception. So the last short, which is simply called Terror, was directed by Ryan Prowse, and is also pretty entertaining, like just a bloody ride, kind of centered around a group of kind of dumpy militia types at some isolated compound somewhere, like up in Michigan, and it's like the middle of the winter, so it's like there's snow everywhere. So they're planning on blowing up a federal building, Timothy McVeigh style, but they have something of a secret weapon in the form of a man that they're keeping captive in a shack that is like festooned with a bunch of wooden crosses. For reasons which don't actually become clear until later on, these uh, sovereign citizen fellas uh, shoot this same man in the head every single day, um, only to have him seemingly return to life on the next day. So again, this was like a really fun story, a nice undercurrent of black humor, uh, some decent gore and creature effects, you know, lots of heads flying, people exploding, stuff like that. So that's always a lot of fun. So I liked this one too. So I have to say that VHS 94, um, maybe not quite as good as the original VHS. I think it's the most consistently enjoyable out of all the ones that I watched uh, so far. Like, I mean, the frame story isn't all that compelling, but they kind of weren't in most of them. So I'm not gonna ding it too much for that. And you know, because, and the other four segments, including that, that cool like little fake commercial were like pretty rad. I'll note as well that keeping all the segments focused around one year, like 1994, um, gave the movie like a lot more of a unified feel to it because you know you didn't get into a thing like you got with viral where there were like a bunch of different video styles and formats and it just kind of made it seem like it was all over the place so again this seemed like much more coherent with the theme and so it just seemed like it hung together better So last up, at least until they make another one, which I think they're I think they're working on at the moment, uh, is VHS 99, which is very recent. Uh, it just premiered in September of 2022 at the Toronto International Film Festival, and then arrived on Shutter a little over months. It's just like a couple weeks ago, like I think October 20th or something like that of 2022. Now VHS 99, when it first premiered, like actually broke the record for most views ever, like on the streaming platform, which actually exceeded the prior record, which had been which had uh, was from VHS 94, which that had the record until this one came along. Now, this installment does stick with the 90s VCR aesthetic throughout all the segments, but unlike the prior entries into the franchise doesn't technically have a frame story that ties all the other segments together, which, you know, to be honest, was no big loss because those were usually the weakest parts of all the other movies. And I have to say, too, that this one leans a lot more heavily into being, like, funny gross and mean-spirited and not really so much on being scary. I kind of feel like most of these segments are more, way more leaning toward like horror comedy than being like straight up horror, being creepy or scary. Like they're just like trying to be gross or funny, like generally. I mean, it's not bad. I think it's better than viral, like which, you know, wasn't really that good at all. And this did actually have some amusing bits to it, but it's kind of something of a come down from VHS 94 in my opinion. Uh, and I will note too that none of the directors from any of the previous installments like reappear in this one. So this is all new, like all different directors. So in lieu of a wraparound, we actually just have like brief clips from this kind of cute like stop motion film uh, featuring toy soldiers. And this is like framed as a movie that was made by a, t by a teenage kid named Brady, who eventually appears later on in the movie, like in the fourth segment, like as a character. Now these interstitials are like not horror related at all, but they're still pretty amusing. And they kind of reminded me of the kind of thing you used to see on like MTV's liquid television, like back in the day, like, you know, like Winter Steel or something like that, where it's like little puppets or like stop motion. It kind of reminded me of that. So I was like, that's that was kind of like a nice little nod to the 90s. So then we jump into the first short, which is called Shredding, and this was directed by uh, Maggie Levin. Now in this one, there's a group of intolerable teenagers, so like teenagers, you know what I mean? Uh, they have a terrible pop punk band called RACK, R-A-C-K, which is like an acronym of all of their names, and they're documenting themselves, uh, you know, screaming about how crazy they are, making horn hand gestures, sticking their tongues out, and generally being like extreme 
you know what I mean? And like very, very try hard. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, have I mentioned how much I hated the 90s? I hated the 90s. So anyway, uh, so for their next sick video bra, uh, they've decided to break into this music venue, which is called the Colony Underground. And it was closed three years ago after a fire broke out there. And the band that was performing at the time, who are an all-female punk band uh, called Bitch Cat, were trampled to death like as their fans went racing for the exits. So the members of Rack are trying to be edgy by kind of being as disrespectful toward the dead women as possible, like while they're in there, um, you know, kind of fucking with like shrines that people made to them and things like that. But one of the kids, uh, Angkor, um, I think is Hindu, and he actually believes in boots, B-H-U-T-S, uh, or ghosts, you know, in, in that uh, mythology. So the other kids just kind of like rag him mercilessly until he basically just was like, fuck you guys, and he like tries to leave in disgust, but... Of course, the zombified, ghostified, whatever members of Bitch Cat return and they're gonna take like grisly revenge on the insolent little shits who broke in and like dissed them or whatever. Uh, this segment, gotta say, was a little bit of a slog. Um, the kids were really tiresome uh, and it took way too long for them to, you know, get pulled apart like a fresh loaf of sourdough already. I was just like, oh my God, can you please just kill them? Um, I mean, it was okay, but it was predictable and a little bit cringy, gotta say. I mean, probably the best out of the five, I guess. Uh, was the second one and that was called Suicide Bid and this was directed by uh, Johannes Roberts. So this story is revolving around a young woman named Lily who is so desperate to get into the Beta Sigma Eta sorority that she only applies to that one, like a move known as a suicide bid, I guess. I don't know anything about fraternities or sororities or anything like that and I don't really care to know. Uh, so the BSE girls, like, you know, the sorority girls are, of course, like horrid twats, <laughs> as, as usual. Uh, and they kind of like find Lily's desperation to get into their sorority, like kind of pathetic. So they decide they're going to engineer a particularly nightmarish hazing for her, which entails burying her in a coffin like overnight after telling her this story about a previous pledge who disappeared doing just that. Like they went to get her in the morning. She was gone somehow. You know what I mean? So they get Lily nice and liquored up and then they throw her into this wooden box and toss a bunch of earth on top of it for good measure. Like they leave a bell. They're like, you know, in the morning, like ring the bell and we'll come and dig you up and then we'll let you in, blah, blah, blah. But of course, things take a terrifying turn. This story was actually pretty good. Um, it was very straightforward and had a kind of like an urban legend type of vibe to it, which I liked. Uh, didn't rely too much on like CGI gore or jump scares, which I feel like a lot of the other ones did. It wasn't really anything all that original like it but it I mean it kind of took like a classic type of story and just executed it well which like I said kind of made it the best one now the third short Ozzy's Dungeon uh actually started out pretty fun but I kind of felt like it went on like way too long you know what I mean and then just got like way too far out there toward the end I'm just like what are you doing like just dial it back a little bit uh so this was directed actually by a uh, record producer Flying Lotus and this one kind of has like a Double Dare style kids show, like if you guys remember that show from Nickelodeon, where the contestants have to go through like this disgusting obstacle course for a chance to have their greatest wish granted. So one girl that's on the show, her name's Donna, and she's from Detroit, and she is like super determined to win the game, even though no kids have actually made it all the way to the end because it's basically impossible. Um, but while she's kind of doing the obstacle course, it seems like she maybe is going to succeed, but then she gets horribly injured in a way that maybe looks like it was a little bit of sabotage or something like that. And so after that, like her righteously pissed off mom ends up kidnapping the game show host, uh, who's played by Stephen Ogg, and he's fucking great at this. This was kind of like the standout performance of the movie because he just plays this sleazy cheese dick and he's like really good at it. So she kidnaps him and puts him through like a similar ordeal in a mock-up of the show's set that the family built in their basement. This one gets pretty weird, like almost Lovecraftian, I want to say, like toward the end, and I'm not real sure that that worked. 
Um, but at least it was unexpected, I'll give it that. This one also wasn't scary at all. I mean, mostly just going for dark humor and the gross out factor. I mean, there's like graphically snapped bones, like lots of vomit, uh, you know, just kind of like somebody like crawling through shit, like stuff like that. It's just like pretty gross. So, but like, and not scary, but I mean, that's okay if that's what you want to do, but it seemed more like a horror comedy. It did have some funny moments though. Like I did laugh out loud a few times. So the next one, The Gawkers, uh, features yet another cohort of irritating teenage boys who of course use their video camera for upskirt shenanigans and so forth so one of the boys ha uh, has a dorky younger brother and they live across the street from this hot blonde named sandra who they usually kind of like spy on as she's like outside washing her car or like dancing around in her room like through her window or whatever so the dorky younger brother uh, gets invited over to sandra's house to help her set up a new webcam because you know he's geek squad or whatever and of course the older boys tell him that it's like hey you can be cool and hang with us if you install some spyware on the webcam so we can watch her like on our own computer at their leisure you know but obviously when it works and so they start doing that uh but then they see some pretty crazy shit that they wish they hadn't uh sandra turns out isn't quite human and that's about all i'm going to say about it and doesn't take real kindly to being watched uh this one again okay but the cgi monster effects again looked pretty cheap and the kids again were pretty fucking tedious like you didn't really want to spend a lot of time with them because they were just like so obnoxious but you know it was an okay story otherwise so the final segment which is called to helen back uh and it was directed by J vanessa and joseph winter this one at least gets points for being somewhat creative uh but i didn't really love the concept i think it would have worked out better like with a bigger budget than what it clearly had so it's about these two guys nate and troy and they're videographers and they've been invited to this house like just a regular house on new year's eve of 1999 and they're supposed to document like a coven of just like regular suburban witches who are summoning a demon called yukaban into the body of one of their members right so accidentally though like before they actually kind of go through with it another very troublesome demon named Fergus, i think shows up and when the witches kind of like try to dispel him or like send him back to hell he happens to have hold of both nate and troy and they subsequently get sucked back to hell like right along with him so now like these two clueless schlubs who still have their cameras rolling then have to like rely upon the help of this demon that they meet whose name is mabel the skull biter uh to get to yukaban and get hold of him before the coven summons him back to like the earthly plane so they can go along for the ride like back from hell you know what i mean so again this one was all right but it was a little bizarre like i said like the concept was a little bizarre nothing wrong with that it's just i'm not really sure it entirely worked um and it kind of like suffered from again like cheap looking effects you can tell that this wasn't a real expensive movie uh, again it wasn't scary just like most of the rest of these uh it did get a couple of chuckles out of me like as nate and troy kind of like bickered about the best way to get out of what they were going to do but like i said it was just like more funny and like a little bit gross this one isn't wasn't even all that gross but it did have some like some gross shit in it like a lot of body parts and things like that but it was mostly just trying to be funny it wasn't like trying to be scary um you know not great but again just like kind of sort of middling so i finally done it after all this time i've talked about all five vhs movies now if i had to rank these movies in order of preference i'd probably say the first one was my favorite, followed by VH, VHS 94, then maybe like VHS 2, then 99, then viral. Honestly, I think I'm going to lay off the found footage movies for a while because this was, I mean, I had a good time, but it was kind of like a lot to sit through like in a short period of time because like i said found footage is not like my favorite subgenre, but i did enjoy these overall but you know obviously some of them are way better than others and i don't think any of them are as good as the first one so if you're only going to watch one i would recommend that vhs 94 is pretty good too the other ones i kind of feel like you could skip them and you wouldn't be missing all that much so thanks again for dropping by and hanging out with me at the salon uh please remember to like and share this video if you like this content and go check out the website scaresalon.com where there's a lot more written content about you know horror movies and books and things like that and i will see you guys again on the next one bye